All right, uh, welcome everyone to uh, the first meeting of uh, spring quarter, Design at Large. Uh, the theme this quarter is ubiquitous computing. Uh, and oh, we're getting off okay. to a great start uh, today. And you'll be, uh, if you're wondering what's ubiquitous computing, well, Tina's going to take care of that for us today. So our first speaker uh, uh, in this term uh, is Tina Ng. Mm -hmm. uh, from the electrical engineering, electrical and computer engineering department, sorry. Uh, and she uh, was just hired uh, in fall quarter. So she's uh, newly arrived, so it's very exciting to, to have her aboard. And uh, she comes to us from uh, Palo Alto Research Center, which is one of the story uh, computer science uh, uh, research centers. Uh, and there are very many famous projects have uh, taken place there, and there are very uh, many uh, of its diaspora uh, are very famous, and so we're very <laughs> lucky to have uh, uh, Tina here on that account. Uh, she got her uh, PhD, I think it was at Cornell University, yes. uh, in uh, chemistry, um, uh, where she studied um, uh, uh, microelectronic device physics. So, uh, so it all kind of comes together and, and comes back here and. and CE, interestingly enough, so a lot of these fields overlap in ways uh, that us software people don't understand. Uh, so uh, with that, um, I'll turn it over to you, Tina. Thank yeah, you. thank you for the introduction. So um, what I wanted to show you today is really a broad overview of the field also in addition to my own research. Um, so within uh, the slides, most of the work has been done at part because I only started in November. Um, but there's also some tidbits of the future direction I'm hoping to go toward and uh, hoping to see if you have collaboration ideas that we can work on together. Um, so first of all, uh, let me explain the title a little bit more. For ubiquitous computing on my, uh, in my aspects of it is um, to make sure that you can have the hardware you need to make computers so this is the vision uh, come up by Mark Weiss or back at Park um, almost 30 years ago where you can have computer that's so embedded natural that we can use it without thinking about it um, so nowadays with mobile electronic like your cell phone, it's really approaching that ne level where you have portable computing. But we are still stuck with a rigid rectangular box, right? Even with your Fitbit, it is a rigid rectangular box. So to us, we think we can make hardware better by um, using other fabrication method that go outside of the rigid rectangular box. So some example here, we actually started with display because human computer interaction started with um, touch sensor or display. And so this big field of flexible electronics started over at that end. Um, and then people start to use the same material to go for other applications like solar cell, where you can generate electricity in remote area. And so um, that's much better than building the grid infra infrastructure in some aspect. And then further on in the last few five or three years, people have been incorporating electronic into bio tissues. They call it bioelectronic, where, for example, this is a big group in this flexible bioelectronic area where they put electrodes on dissolvable material, and then if you integrate that onto a tissue, the material dissolve conformally, and now you have much better signal to noise ratio with this type of um, flexible structure. And then within this um, field, we have two major approaches. One is people try to use the conventional material, but they need to grow it at high temperature at really stringent environment. And those high temperature material requires to transfer it to the flexible substrate. People have done amazing things, like you can see this geometrical structure um, that's stretchable, bendable. Um, but there are caveats that placement accuracy is tough, um, alignment is tough. And so there's also another approach where people directly deposit those 
uh, active electronic material onto the flexible surface. And in fact, this is not that new. It, it's done um, 20 years ago. That's the amorphous silicon material that you use every day in your laptop, in your cell phone. Um, it's just not economical to grow a single crystal silicon to the size of your laptop. And so um, people find an alternative way to deposit thin film amorphous silicon. And with that, it revolutionized our mobile computing. Otherwise, we would still be carrying our chunky CRT tubes everywhere. So that is really important. Um, and within that, there is caveat too, where we cannot um, expect the performance of those materials to reach single crystalline level. And so the disorder in that material have been um, one major material research area. Um, so with this, I want to just summarize saying, there are um, approaches to making flexible electronics, but there's a lot of material science that still need to be done in order to realize all the fancy things you want. Um, and then with the, my approach is more on the latter side where we directly deposit uh, thin film materials. And with that approach, we could go beyond conventional photolithographic processing. Um, so in conventional lithography, you do have subtractive step where you deposit the thin film and then you mask it and edge and pattern those deposited film. But with solution processable material, um, we find that you can actually use inkjet that directly deposit material on demand in location that you want. And it actually saves a lot of step and material. We calculated at one point 10 microliter is enough to cover a four, four inch wafer. Um, that's orders of magnitude less material than a conventional process. Um, however, caveat again in that inkjet was built for um, eye resolution. We didn't build the machine to for electronic, and so the resolution there is about 35 micron, what your eyes can resolve. Um, and so that resolution is good for uh, human computer act interaction electronics, like touch sensor display, and we are exploring more idea. But um, for electronic, it's a little bit too low resolution. It's almost like Grand Canyon for electronic, too big a gap. So there are approaches people have been doing to, to um, increase resolution, and I will talk more about that. But one approach is with imprint, um, where you stamp and pattern the material directly. Uh, there's microfluidics and other hardware consideration. Um, I won't touch on that, but um, so these are the two approaches we use in uh, my research. And it, you might have heard about the uh, National um, Manufacturing Institute, so I'm somewhat active in that because right now, um, in order to revitalize the manufacturing industry in America, um, we are looking into advanced digital manufacturing. And this is one of the approaches that could help make us more competitive. Um, so for example, instead of giant vacuum chambers in order to deposit the solar cell material. We want to be able to make it as a row-to-row -row, uh, printing process that's lower cost. And, and that is related to ubiquitous computing because we, if we can meet, make a lot more electronic in a high volume, high throughput um, way, then we would be able to have distributed sensor in a more economical way. So here are some examples of the printed components people have. Uh, this is actually from the lab I was in, and i done this. So um, a lot of sensors now you can even buy on SparkFun. Um, they are printed sensors, uh, temperature, light, pressure, 
And we also call certain types of laser cut sensors, uh, the MAM sensor as printed. Laser cutting is one type of printing. Um, and then in my lab, we also do a lot more um, device work, like thin film transistor and even battery. So you can embed material in fabric, in paper, on plastic. Um, there's a lot of material choices, actually. But for us, individual sensors are great, but we want to be able to build more than just individual sensor. So I want to show you one approach that will give you more functionality than just one sensor. So here is one, um, the very simplest approach. Uh, we put one transistor with one sensor or display element in each pixel. And that's the simplest circuit ever. Um, so what the transistor does is like a valve. When you switch it on, then it will directly read the signal out from the sensor or um, apply signal to the media that you want to switch on. And so by having this spatial array, you could make an output display. display. So that's like the e-reader you use in your Kindle. Actually, this is really the structure they have in Kindle. And then um, or OLED display with uh, cell phones. Uh, or the other thing is you can switch that media into a sensor. So now we could also put uh, that into, put a photodiode there, and then we can have photo imager or touch sensor. And here, I want to point out why we need to do this. You can also array our individual sensors, right? But if you think about it, once we make it into a giant format, if I have a hundred sensor by a hundred sensor, then I will have um, one to the fourth lines just coming out to route the sensor. And how my lines is even more complex than the sensor itself. So this transistor structure reduces that complexity. Instead of multiplying the number of bus lines, you add the bus lines. So now a 100 by 100 matrix is just 200 lines. So by adding that device in, we, we are enabling um, a more complex system to come out of it. So uh, now I want to go specifically more into this two topic because I have done more on that. So one of the one of the uh, first application that I use with this architecture is actually a flexible X-ray imager. Um, the reason we wanted it to uh, be an X-ray imager is actually um, in order to have low radiation dose on your body, you want to shine x-ray light once and take all the data once. You don't want to stitch it because then you will expose that person to multiple radiation dose and that's um, something to be avoided. That's why we need an large area uh, imager. And then the second reason why we want it to be flexible is DOD. <laughs> we do have some clients in um, the defense people department where they want it to be more flexible and more um, uh, transportable. Other, I, other, um, the third reason why we wanted it is actually you could make it conformal to your body too. Then you get rid of the projection effect and if you directly um, curve around it, you have more accurate measurement. So the three reasons that we want to go into a flexible X-ray imager. And I want to just go, this is the, the way how the X-ray imager in your dental office work. It actually is a scintillator and they shine X-ray, um, then the X-ray pass through this scintillator convert the X-ray into visible wavelength light. And that visible wavelength light um, is uh, projected onto the pixels and by reading the pixel out one by one, you reconstitute the image and have a spatial resolution of your, your, your uh, subject that you're imaging. So currently, people use inorganic material to make that sensor, so the flexibility is not there. And they need it to be heavy glass, heavy material. So now we want to convert this into uh, flexible um, device. So one approach 
uh, I'm more of a material scientist. My background is chemistry. Um, is in tuning that material. It's actually quite um, different from that conventional approach because with our organic photodiode, we can actually blend the P and the N semiconductor together. So instead of having well uh, separated P and N layer in a conventional PN junction, we just put those two solutions, mix it together, and put a thin film on top of the back plane. And with this, we, we could actually have advantages. For example, when light shines at that photodiode layer, instead of um, being confined into the single interface at that PN junction, now we have a lot of interfaces. And at the interface, because the two materials have different band alignment, it helps to separate the charge. And so with more interfaces, we have more um, uh, band uh, facilitated charge separation uh, mechanism to collect more photogenerated charge. And so that's how this uh, photodiode works. In addition to being simple to process, it actually have pretty decent um, efficiency. And so a lot of people wanted to use this for photovoltaics. It's a big field in our field. It's a big area in our field too. Um, but for me, I'm more focused on the um, imager aspect of it. So I'm using this for the imaging application. And so now you can see by putting that material onto the flexible backplane, we could make an X-ray imager and a visible um, light diode. Uh, light imager. And the sensitivity of it is pretty good. Um, uh, we could um, measure 30 picowatt per centimeter square. That translate in physical term into you can image a clear night sky. Um, that's more than sufficient. Um, and then the fun thing we can do with it is we can, because we are fabricating it on plastic, we could do some origami and cut and connect the different region to make it into a dome shape imager. And with this dome shape imager, we have better um, field of view, so you will have less aberration at the edges. And so when we start to do this type of mechanical assembly, we start to wonder, well, um, if we subject the material under stress, what will happen? Will we get uh, degradation in performance? And indeed, we do. Um, so for example, in one area of the substrate, we might see um, higher resistance than in another area. And so now, if we have more resistance, you can imagine the signal coming out from it would be attenuated, right? And we could calibrate this if it's a fixed structure. But then if people use it um, arbitrarily and bend it at a different angle, then we cannot even calibrate out that um, attenuation. So now we have to find another approach that we could account for the mechanical problem. Um, so one approach back to being an electrical engineer, engineer is to um, think about frequency versus amplitude modulation. And so with this simple architecture, we demonstrated a lot of things, but right now it's not quite enough. So we added a digitizing circuit into the pixel. So what that means is um, we converted the amplitude into frequency, so higher amplitude would have higher frequency. And then even if there's resistant change and attenuation, um, we still will get the same frequency output. So now we get rid of that um, problem with bending and uh, uncontrolled attenuation. So now here is one approach to do that, to convert from amplitude to frequency. It's actually very simple. It's a, um, fundamental circuit in electrical engineering, a ring oscillator. Um, when you apply higher voltage to a ring oscillator, each stage would flip faster. And so with faster flipping, your oscillation would 
would be at higher frequency. So, so this is the plot that shows with higher input voltage, you have higher, um, uh, uh, this is lower oscillation time, higher frequency. And then we use this circuit for a touch sensor application. So um, this is in collaboration with my um, colleague at Stanford. We were just across the street. And she ran into this problem where um, her touch sensor was uh, not as accurate as we would want. And so we put her touch sensor together with this ring oscillator circuit. And um, so now we could have a press with higher pressure, the resistance of the pressure sensor would decrease. So there's higher voltage going into the oscillator. So with higher voltage, again, we would flip faster. So it now become a device where you can measure the input pressure and get a high, uh, output frequency signal. And then to extend this further, we actually wanted to use it to be a prosthetic device, where um, instead of having a circuit on a, a prosthetic arm that's um, very complicated to control, we integrated this circuit together. And now um, we could use that frequency signal and drive the somatosensory neuron cells. So this is a plot where we have a pledge clamp to notice to um, detect whether the cell is responding. So basically, we press the sensor, uh, send frequency signal to stimulate the brain cell, and then try to see whether the brain cell follow our stimulation. And it does pretty well. Um, we find out one caveat here is the brain cell actually is quite slow. On my circuit is already slow enough, but actually we have to tune it to even slower than uh, normal in order for the brain cell to follow. So it was actually really good for organic circuit because most of the people would be like, oh, organic circuit is not good enough. But actually, we were fast enough even for brain cells. Um, and the main uh, selling point for this is really our power consumption. It's orders of magnitude lower than the conventional amplitude modulation approach. Um, so this is the uh, part about using active matrix in order to uh, develop light imager and touch sensor. And I want to point out there's also more things we could do with uh, just this simple, versatile architecture. For example, um, this group in Tokyo, they already demonstrated a lot of fun, flexible electronic. And one of the things they did with Active Matrix is to make a Braille sensor, uh, actuator. So they um, pixelate it, and then here is a Braille controller that um, can give out different messages uh, to the blind. Um, another. Uh, Thing besides touch, sight, there's also smell, right? So there are things we could do with making a sen electronic nose. Um, the reason being important, uh, the reason this is important is that uh, the sensitivity of electronics to certain analytes is usually um, it's hard to tell whether it's negative result. It's, uh, the analyte is sensitive to a lot of things, but when you array it out, then the signature of that array gives you much more information than individual sensor. So that's why having a matrix is important in this application. Um, and then for me, I'm also staying somewhat in the photo imaging area. I did X-ray and photo imager. And then I find that there is also more wavelength to explore in the electromagnetic spectrum. Because we could go to infrared spectrum and see different things than just visible wavelength light. Uh, from going to visible to short wavelength infrared, you could see it's, the wavelength is longer, so it goes through haze. And then um, this company actually did another very fun demo where in the visible uh, visible region, you see this guy looks normal. 
But when you look at it with infrared spectrum, you can see he has beer disguise in that because now we can tell the material property difference by that spectrum. And so uh, imaging with different spectral region will give us a lot of information. So with that, I want to move on to some other examples of printed circuits. And this is even um, more electrical and hardware engineering. So I hope you will bear with me. But I think you will want to know why we have challenges in this field. So this will be um, giving you uh, some of the glimpse of what needs to be done to go to the next step. So for, um, for Internet of Things, uh, we have some at part, there were clients who are interested in printing smart tags, printing um, distributed sensors. And one of the applications I worked on was actually this temperature monitoring tag for vaccines. Um, they want to warn the user if during transit, the vaccine experienced um, a higher temperature than desirable, then it would uh, trigger the display and show this is uh, over the limit. And so the user would be careful whether they want to use the vaccine or not. And then another thing um, that was from RPA-E, they have a program where they want to monitor methane leakage over large area. And so distributed sensor is important. And also, again, array analyte sensing instead of just one individual point sensor. Um, so with this approach, we could print the sensor, but we find out there are uh, variations that need to be dealt with. And also, the printed electronic currently is not at the level of conventional electronic. And it never might. We need to find com complementary applications for it. So the approach here is to print the components that are easy and need different um, materials while we use conventional electronic and use a lot of the computational power of com conventional electronic to do the signal processing. Um, so one of, the, one of the important improvement we have to do is actually the device variations. Um, it, it's, uh, so if we look into one single stage, people always do single devices, single sensors, right? And this is very nice textbook looking curve. But then once we print a lot of the sensors and start to look into the eye diagram and noise spectrum, you see that with not much variation, 10% variation, we start to have um, uh, shrinking noise margin. And that means whatever peak, whatever noise peak you have, it will give you a wrong result. And that's not acceptable. Um, so we did Monte Carlo simulation and with standard deviation of 10%, we could get 80% yield. So that's somewhat marginal. And 5%, we could get 98% yield. Um, and this is only for this simple circuit of only 11 components. So you can imagine if we think about going to the um, conventional electronic billions of transistor level, how much worse this could be. So that's why we need to take a different approach and think about what printed electronics is good for in terms of having um, more variation, but still uh, have the advantage of reconfigurability. Um, but one of the fundamental thing once you see this is where does the variation comes from, right? Uh, so I did a lot of work on trying to figure that out because I'm a materials person. And when I look into this, the first question I ask is, is it because of the printing process? Uh, I'm not using conventional uh, lithography. And so it's the printing resolution affecting the device performance. So here's some statistic on uh, all printed devices versus conventional photolithographic devices using the solution processable material. And you could see the variation. Actually, it's as bad between conventional processing as the printing processing. 
So now we start to think, okay, it's really not due to the source strain patterning of our uh, transistor. It's more due to the material, the disorderness that I introduced earlier. And when you look into more of the device physics, um, for example, in this inverter curve, um, this variation, if you look into the actual equations, um, the threshold voltage, the device physics of it is the, um, the semiconductor insulator uh, surface is actually more important to control. It's linearly proportional to that inversion voltage versus the dimension of your transistor because that's square root dependent. And so, in our printing, we also learned that we, it's absolutely critical to control this printing surface. Otherwise, I won't get good definition. And so with this type of um, uh, surface control and um, material processing, I won't go into the detail because you guys might not want to be burdened with the material chemistry. But by changing the uh, surface chemistry from more hydrophilic to more hydrophobic, we were able to adjust this threshold voltage and also tighten up the transistor performance. And so, yeah, different generations of the transistors are shown here. The first generation, they work, but then there's much, too much variation up to 40%. And then as time goes on, we control the printing parameter much better. We control jetting condition, layout designs, etc. And we were able to reach the target of 10%, which give us 85% yield. And so that's how we were able to build more complex system out of this. And the important thing is we also did a lot of simulations to understand how to um, design circuit that tolerate this processing window problem. Um, so there are um, computer simulation modeling and hardware uh, iterations involved. So with this tag, basically it measures a threshold temperature and when the temperature goes above a certain limit, it triggers and write to the memory cell and write to the display to warn the user. And this is accurate up to one, per, uh, one degree Celsius. So with another um, uh, so after having the ability to make a little bit more complex structure, I really want to show whether we could approach even more um, performance in the next, in the near future, right? So in our field, people have been using different semiconductors. Um, the organics and oxides are uh, very easy to print, but they have low mobility value. And then you might have heard about 2D materials and carbon nanotube, um, uh, graphene, and etc., which has very high performance. But instead of only tuning materials, we actually need to look into the device physics itself. And when you um, pattern a device, the electron has to move from one electrode to another. And the gap between that will also determine your transistor performance. And by changing that resolution, by changing that gap, you actually win a lot of performance with, uh, without changing the material. For example, if we change the resolution of that gap from 10 micron to 1 micron, we win uh, order of, uh, uh, we win 100 times in terms of the maximum frequency. That's almost like changing your material to something very exotic and very high performance. So this is 100 times, and that's 100 times in mobility. And this is actually Moore's law. The reason why transistor in silicon has always been saying we need to shrink the gap, we need to go smaller and smaller, is due to this dimensional dimensionality. Like if instead of changing silicon, we just need to shrink silicon gap and that give us much, much higher performance. So in order to have higher printed resolutions, we went to nano imprint. 
And here, um, this is one of the nano imprinter where we could define um, a narrow gap between electrodes. The problem with nano imprint is it, it's good for periodic structures. But then when you have more um, turning corners, more complex architecture, um, the fidelity of the pattern doesn't come out anymore. And so uh, for us, building circuit using nano imprint was quite difficult because uh, to adjust the microfluidic of how inks turn corners is very difficult. So to us, we actually combine the periodic nice array we can fabricate with the digital reconfiguration of inkjet. So now we print the periodic gaps that has high resolution with imprint and then with the big pads and big control um, channel dimensions, we print it with inkjet, which has much lower resolution. And with the combination approach, we have the advantage of high resolution, but also reconfigurability. So here's some example of using the same universal architecture at the underneath substrate, and then we print different um, connection on top of it, then we could build different logic gates, NOR and NAND gates, those are basic logic gates. And here's a benchmark of what it really does. Um, so with the hybrid approach, we shrunk the channel by um, uh, to t five micron. And then inject the narrowest, narrowest channel we could approach is 35. So with this, um, simple change of the resolution, we increase the frequency of our oscillator by a hundred times. Uh, wait, by 10 times, yeah. So if you were paying attention to my Morse law, actually, um, this is increasing the, decreasing the channel width by seven times, and it should be inversely proportional, right? So I should have fifth for uh, seven to the square. So I should have 50 times improvement, but I only have 10 times improvement here. So there are still other material aspects that didn't uh, get taken into account, such as contact resistance and, and um, line width variations. But um, this is one direction we can take to get better patterning, to get reconfigurability while having the resolution we need. And so not, lastly, I want to touch on um, this topic of digital printing. Um, so we actually had a visit with NASA, and they were very excited in applying digital printing um, in remote location, uh, so to say in space. Um, and now you might have heard a lot about 3D printing in space already. Um, for this project, it was two years ago, and that was when uh, printing in space was popular. And the program manager basically wanted to say, let's bring raw material up, and then we could have more flexibility in what electronic we make, instead of make all the electronic on Earth and then have to send it up to space. So that's the freedom they want. And that's why we started this very small seedling project. It's all done on terrestrial territory, but um, the concept is that we would be able to reconfigure um, once we have a proof of concept. So here's one of the printer we built. Uh, so in addition to inkjet, we also have extrusion where we could um, print different structures. Uh, so for this program, we actually mainly wanted to do hybrid electronic, which means we would um, delegate the hard computational task to off-the-shelf chips, but then try to print as much passives, as much sensor as possible um, with uh, digital printing. So for example, antenna coil and interconnect, that's very easy for printing. So we were able to do that and then put the conventional chip uh, 
and connect them together. So we did a uh, temperature sensor and light sensor connected to the two uh, microcontroller chip, one microcontroller chip and an RF communication chip here. Um, and then this is one of the prototypes where we have uh, the light sensor read out remotely, wirelessly, and also the temperature sensor read out um, uh, from this smart tag. And we did send it to lower space, but on the way back, it got um, dunk into the ocean, and so we didn't collect <laughs> data. Um, but that was really, even without that, uh, well, I wish we had that, but um, during the project, we did learn a lot in terms of how do you configure hybrid electronic with flexible substrates. So um, you might have seen people now thin down dyes and try to make the material as thin as possible so it would stick on um, flexible structure. And, um, but then for us, we find out that a lot of the advantage in packaged chips will be gone if you have to use bare dye alone and thin it down and that's much more processing. So we want to use off the shelf chips, but then we see that this is glass, but it's similar to, uh, but we want to represent it as off the shelf chip. And then once we stick it on, the breakage point is always at the interface from the rigid area to the flexible area. This stress is just so high that um, that's where the failure point always happens. And so with um, mechanical engineer, we decided that instead of an abrupt interface, we just need a gradual transition. And with materials, we can tune the cross linker from the rigid surface to the flexible substrate by different cross link ratio. And now we have a gradient. And so that could relieve the stress and then we can have rigid chips on flexible substrate very reliably. And also that inspired us to do work on um, electroactive polymer. So what this means is uh, I also want to build structure that could be actuated electronically. Um, so being a material scientist, one of the uh, material set we could use is actually this ionic liquid. It's quite, um, it's a new salt in, that, in the sense that it's always ionic, but it doesn't evaporate, it doesn't, um, uh, it has a lot of interesting property. And by putting that into a hydrogen, uh, into a polymer uh, host, and then if you apply a voltage, the ionic, the ion size are different. So once you apply a voltage, the cation move to one side, anion to the another. And because of the size difference, one side swell and one side shrink. And just this simple mechanism, let us make actuator like a bimorph and bendable um, structure. And back to my, uh, uh, application about lighting and sensor, we are thinking of putting uh, electroactive polymer as the substrate and then if you could put photodiode or lighting up here, then you can have adjustable focal length for photo sensing or you can have different um, curvature of lighting projection with this active structure. And to print this, it actually involved more 3D design rules and, and um, still working on it. <laughs> so in summary, I hope I have shown you uh, the field's movement from active matrix to more complex circuit. And then also within the field, we have to um, meet the challenge of how do you deal with the printing variation? How do you um, embed electronic between rigid substrate and flexible materials? Um, and so um, I would be open to questions and this is my acknowledgement to my part colleagues, collaborator and funding agencies. Thank you.